a continuation of the life of Thomas Halliburton, narrated on his 343rd birthday, Christmas 2017. Chapter 4, containing an account of the progress of the Lord's work, the straits I was reduced to, and the courses I took for relief. From May 1693, when I left Edinburgh, till I went to the family of Weymouth, August 1696. The heir agreeing neither with my mother nor me, she was advised and at length resolved to leave Edinburgh and to go to St. Andrews, a place more wholesome and more convenient for my education, to which she always had a special regard. Here I cannot but observe the remarkable kindness of the Lord in guiding me, though then I took no notice of it. I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me. At a time when my heart inclined me most to folly, and by my entering to the college I was exposed to many temptations to it, the Lord seasonably laid his hand on me and trysted me with trouble. That was a mean to restrain me and keep me from contrasting any intimacy with those whose converse might have proven prejudicial to me and to engage me to choose sober comrades. Thou shalt also consider in thine heart that as a man chasteneth his son, so the Lord thy God chastens you. Again, secondly, this indisposition during the first two months of my stay at the college, being only in my joints, did not hinder but further my studies. And the Lord provided one who, though a stranger and under no special obligations, yet attended me as close as he had been my servant, and was as tender of me as if he had been my brother. During this time I made greater proficiency in the Latin tongue than I ever had formerly done, the regent I was under being very skillful in teaching it, and attending very carefully. After this time he fell ill and was not capable to attend, and I fell ill and was therefore obliged to remove to St. Andrews, which was much to my advantage. For I came under the care of Mr. Thomas Taylor, a man very capable and very careful and kind to me. And the class I left was broke quite, the regent continuing indisposed that year, and falling next year into a frenzy. So the Lord chased me from place to place for my good, and everywhere provided me friends. He found him in a desert land, and in the waste and howling wilderness. He led him about and instructed him. He kept him as the apple of his eye. But God's kindness in guiding to places for my good, and keeping from inconveniences, snares, and dangers, into which others fell, had no effect, nor were they noticed by me. Neither, said they, where is the Lord that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, that led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts, and of pits, through a land of drought, and of the shadow of death? And I brought you into a spiritual country, so to eat the fruit thereof, and the goodness. But when you entered, you defiled my land, and made mine heritage an abomination. When I settled at St. Andrews, the Lord left not his work in striving with me, but the same sovereign grace had begun, went on with it. Here the Lord cast my lot under choice means of grace, a ministry of worthy Mr. Thomas Forrester. Under this searching ministry, the Lord began to give me some small discoveries of the more secret and spiritual evils of my heart, and carried me into the secret chambers of imagery. He opened mine eyes to discern somewhat of that world of pride that is in the heart and the wickedness of it. Though I was some way convinced of my own weakness when I had any difficulty more than ordinary before me and would seek help from God, yet when I got through I valued myself upon my acquaintance of the wickedness and unjustness of this, the Lord in some measure convinced me. What is thou, O man, that thou hast not received? And if thou hast received it, wherefore dost thou boast? First Corinthians 4, 7. He convinced me of the wickedness of the strain of my heart after idols, especially in the time of worship. But as for them whose heart walks after the heart of their detestable things and their abominations, I will recompense their ways upon their own heads, saith the Lord God. Ezekiel 11.21 For every one of the house of Israel, or of the stranger, which sets up his idols in his heart, and puts the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and comes to a prophet to inquire of him concerning me, I the Lord will answer him by myself. Ezekiel 14.4-7 
I was made to see in some measure the danger of offering such duties to him who requires us to set our hearts to what he speaks and to keep our foot when we come to the house of God. I was likewise made to see somewhat of my trusting to my duties and resting on the bare performance, and as much as I was not for the most part challenged for unsuitable performance, but for the entire omission of them. And with the Pharisee I thought it enough if I could say that I did the duty, but now the Lord let me see that more was required. Though with him I could say I fast twice a week, the Lord convinced that he might answer, When you fasted, did you at all fast unto me, even to me? Zechariah 7.5 These, when added to former discoveries of guilt, gave me frequently much disturbance and cast me into racking perplexity and disquiet. But the darkness and enmity of my mind remaining, I still had recourse to wicked and vain courses for peace, such as those formerly mentioned. But they afforded me but little quiet. Feral-like... I engaged to amend those things in which formerly I had failed, but with him I quickly broke bargain when the force that drove to this was over. At last, finding no peace in any of these courses, I resolved to enter into solemn covenant with the Lord, and accordingly I wrote and subscribed a solemn covenant whereby I bound myself to be for God, like Israel, when under the awful impressions of Sinai, and the dreadful appearance of God there, I said, All that the Lord our God shall say unto us, we will hear and do it. Deuteronomy 5:23 and 28. And a like scribe that came to Christ, Master, I will follow you wherever you go. Luke 9:57. When I had once done this, then I concluded all was right. For first I found a sort of present peace. A minman, I thought, Sufficient atonement, and such an engagement I looked on as performance. I now said I have peace offerings with me this day. I have paid my vows. Proverbs 7.14 Number 2. I at this time found frequently an unusual sweetness in hearing the word, especially in hearing Mr. Forrester lecture on Acts 13.43 on the Sabbath night. Here is I receive sometimes the most piercing conviction, so I receive tastes of the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. 1 Corinthians 14.25, Hebrews 6.5 Thus, like the stony ground, I heard a word and anon with joy received it. Number three, common gifts increase in his light grew. I took them for special grace, and thus have taken up with the foolish virgins the lamp of our profession without oil. Matthew 25.1 I began to set up for a virgin too, and liking such, I began to be esteemed by some of them for that which really I was not, but only appeared to be. But the merciful and good God would not allow me to rest here. Yet thou sayest, because I am innocent, surely his anger shall turn from me. Behold, I will plead with you, because you say I have not sinned. Why do you get about so much to change your way? You also shall be ashamed of Egypt as you were ashamed of Assyria. The Lord quickly let me see my mistake, for first, the imaginary peace that I had by making this covenant was quickly lost by breaking it. Corruption retaining still its power, its locks not being yet cut. Whenever a temptation offered, like Samson upon a cry of the Philistines being on him, it broke all those ties with which I foolishly, like his deceived mistress, thought it bound." Like the children of Israel in Sinai, I engaged fairly in here and thought all right. But I, when I came to Kilbreth Hataava, which was the next station in their way through the wilderness, and a temptation fell in my way, I felt a murmuring, loathing the manna and lusting after the flesh, and this broke all. The Lord's wrath hereon being afresh intimated against me as it was against them on that occasion. Number two, not only upon such breaches met I with new challenges, but old ones were revived, and by this I found former accounts still to be standing against me, which filled me with confusion and jealousy of these ways. For though thou wash you with nitre, and take you much soap, your iniquity is marked before me, saith the Lord, Jeremiah 2.22. Number three, the Lord insinuated some discoveries of the treachery of my engagements. Let me see how my heart was not sound, and how there were secret reserves in my engagements for some sins from which my heart was not divorced. 
Though yet I remember that at the time I made those engagements when my heart put in for sparing these, my light forced me, as it were, for the present, though not without reluctance to give them up, at least in words. But really I did not do it. Now the Lord gave some intimations of this heart treachery, which, when further discovered by the event, my covenant could not quiet me about. They have well spoken all that they have said. Oh, that there were such an heart in them. Deuteronomy 5.29 Number 4. The Lord let loose some corruptions like the Canaanites to try me, took off the restraints, and then like waters dammed in, they became more violent and troublesome, and at length bore down all that I said in their way. By these means the Lord let me see the fruitlessness and vanity of this covenant, which, however specious-like, was indeed but a covenant with death. And by the discovery I was put into the utmost confusion, while the evil I thought I was provided against came upon me. This I found verified to my sad experience. Notwithstanding the felt vanity of these legal, selfish, anti-evangelical courses, I still cleave to them. For first, the peace I lost by breaking, I still endeavored to recover by renewing my covenant, trusting to a heart that had often deceived me. Thus I wearied myself in the greatness of my way, and labored in the fire. My heart, when I was defeated, gave me such advice as the king of Syria got from his servants when he was defeated by Israel. I laid the blame still on some accidental defect in my former management, and I thought, were that provided against, all would be well. When still I found something lacking, I cast about in my own mind and contrived to make it up with something extraordinary of my own, the multiplication of duties or some such thing or other. Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Micah 6, 6 and 7. But still these vain refuges failed me, and my case was truly miserable while pursuing them. Now as I was really miserable in the following those courses so, if the Lord of infinite mercy had not prevented it, I had landed in one of four sad issues, in which oftentimes such exercises and course terminate, either one, if I had been freed from convictions, or the Lord had given over his striving with me and carrying on the work of conviction. After convictions had carried me the length of a form of religion, I had surely, notwithstanding all the disappointments, sat down satisfied with that as having found the life of my hand or having by the endeavors of my hand in its labor obtained that which would give me a sort of life. Or two, if convictions had been carried on, and the Lord had left me still to follow those courses I took, I would have labored in the fire all my days, wearied and vexed myself for very vanity, spending my money for that which is not bread, and my labor for that which does not profit. Habakkuk 2.13 in a continual vicissitude of vows, covenants, engagements, and resolutions, breaches and disquietments, engagements and false peace, breaches and racking convictions would alternatively have taken place. And thus I had spent my days and at the end been a fool. Or number three, after I had wearied myself for a while in those vain ways, I would have utterly given up with religion as a vain thing, and said with those mentioned by the prophet who said, It is vain to serve God. And what profit is it that we have kept his ordinances, and that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts? Malachi 3.14 And so with them I had gone over to plain atheism and profanity, or fourthly, being forced to seek shelter from my convictions. And being so often and sadly disappointed by all the ways I tried, I had at last landed in despair like Judas, and said, This evil is of the Lord, why wait I any longer? Second Kings 6.33 Like Elisha at the message of the wicked king. And in very deed I had some experience of all these issues. Sometimes I sat down with the form and judged I was rich and increased in goods and stood in need of nothing. Revelation 3.17 Sometimes I wearied myself in running from one of those vain courses to another. At other seasons I turned careless as finding no profit, 
and was just at throwing up all care of religion, and very often I was upon the very brink of despair, almost quite distracted. When I was thus disappointed, especially after the making and frequent repeating of vows and engagements, I was cast into the utmost perplexity to find where the fault lay. I found this way of covenanting with God recommended by ministers mentioned in the scripture, and the people of God declared they had found the benefit of it. I could not challenge myself at least at some times for known guile in the making of it. What I engaged to do, I was resolved upon at the time. I didn't engage with much concern and solemnity, and for some time after, I would have walked with much strictness, but though I could not then discern where the blame lay, I have since been made to see it. Being ignorant of the righteousness of God, I still went about to establish a righteousness of my own, Romans 10.3. And though in words I renounce this, yet indeed I sought righteousness and peace, not in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes, Romans 10.4. But in my own covenants and engagements, so that I really put them in Christ's room, Whatever room I in words allowed Christ as to forgiveness for bygones, yet my peace and hope of it for the future, and so my trust was the evenness of my own walk. I obtained not righteousness because I sought it, as it were, by the works of the law. Romans 9.32 This neglect of Christ in shuffling my own covenants and obedience in his room was evident. Because whenever I was challenged for sin, instead of recourse to his blood, I still sought peace only in renewing my vows. The consent I gave to the law was not from the reconcilement of my heart to its holiness, but merely in compliance with the constraint put on me by my convictions. But in very deed the enmity against it still continued, Romans 8, 7. And I would not have made it my choice if that had not forced me to it so that I subjected not myself to it. I engaged to live a new life with an old heart, not being yet made to see that unless a tree is made good, the fruit cannot be good. Matthew 12.33 The eye was not single. All I aimed at was self, to be eased of convictions that obtained peace from those racking disquietments I was under. I had not the least concern for the Lord's glory, provided I were safe. In a word, I engaged before the Lord had thoroughly engaged me. We may be willing in some sort before the Lord has made us truly willing. The first real kindness begins on his side, and we are never engaged to love till the Lord's kindness draws us, First John 4.10. The force of a straight by convictions may overpower us into some pretensions to kindness. Thus it was with me. Willing as I was to be saved from hell and to have heaven under the general notion of a good place, but not to be saved in God's way on his terms, and in order to those ends which he proposes in the salvation of sinners. This is not my only trouble at this time. Now I was engaged in the study of metaphysics and natural theology, accustomed to subtle notions and tickled with them, whereupon Satan, in conjunction with the natural atheism of my heart, took occasion to cast me into racking disquietment about the great truths of religion, more especially the being of a god. Thus, in the justice of God, that wherein I delighted, I mean subtle and abstract notions, proved the occasion of much perplexing difficulty to me. Thus I was thus entangled, rather than extricated by these selfish shifts, yet my vain mind still followed these courses for first. What before this I had failed of, I expected I might find by some further progress in learning, and therefore I applied myself vigorously that way. But any little progress I made made me still more sensible how far I was disappointed, and made me experience the truth of this, that he that increases knowledge increases sorrow, Ecclesiastes 1.18. The further I proceeded, I still found the more difficulties and the less satisfaction. When this course could not avail, then I spent my weary hours and vain wishes for some extraordinary discoveries. Nay, but if one rise from the dead, they will believe. Luke 16.30 Though I didn't reach the satisfaction I aimed at, yet I cannot say but this exercise had some useful effects. First, it let me see that I had need of some further evidence and establishment about the truths of religion than hitherto I had either attained 
or wist how to attain. Thus I'd got some view of it before, now I was more confirmed of it. My mind being sometimes more quieted as to these truths and hearing of the word than by all my arguments, I was inclined to hope this evidence I lacked might come from the Lord. I was beaten somewhat from that towering opinion of my own knowledge and abilities to know that my first seeming success in philosophy gave me, and brought to a useful diffidence of my inability to reach satisfaction, even about natural things, and solve objections that lay against truths, which yet upon clear argument I was forced to admit, which afterwards was of a considerable use to me. But during this period of time, under all these wrestlings and strugglings between growing light and sin, corruptions, as I grew in years, grew stronger and stronger, took deeper root, and had received an increase of strength by occasional temptations and new force from the weak resistance made to them by these vain courses. As the law came nearer in its spiritual meaning and extent, sin revived and appeared more discernible in its strength, and sin taken occasion by the commandment wrought in me inclinations to all evil. Romans 7, 8, 9, and 11. Being fretted, not subdued, it grew stronger till at length it slew me. Under this perplexity I betook myself still to one or other of the aforementioned vain courses. I got it about to change my way, sent to Egypt and went to Assyria, yet could not they help me. Jeremiah 2.36 But yet these exercises and perplexities had some intermissions, and then I turned remiss and careless. My goodness, like the morning cloud and early dew, soon passed away. Hosea 6, 4. However, by these means I was brought to a specious-like form of religion. For now, first, I took some care to avoid those sins, whether secret or open, that thwarted the light of my conscience most plainly. I not only abstained from those evils to which most, even of the more sober sort of students, were frequently drawn over, but with a sort of resolution I kept at a distance from the occasions of them. Thus I began to escape the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the truth. Second Peter 2.20 I was more exact and punctual in attending duties, public, private, and secret, than I was before and that not without some concern, at least sometimes, as to my inward frame in them. Thus I thought I kept his ordinances, Malachi 3.14. When I was ensnared either into the commission of sin or omission of duty, I was brought to a deep sorrow, and for some time walked mournfully before God, Malachi 3.14. Whereas I always had a sort of awful regard for them that feared God, since ever I began to be in the least awake, and now I began to have a sort of liking and kindness to them, and pleasure in their company and converse, even about matters of religion. Thus light forced an approbation of them on my mind, and so to give glory to God, their light shining so before me that I could not but take notice of them, Matthew 5.16. I had frequent tastes of the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, Hebrews 6.5, which made me delight in approaching to God. In 6, I got some things that looked like return of prayer when under a sense of impotency I betook myself to God by prayer. In any strait I found help so remarkable that I could not but take notice of it. The Lord by this drew me gradually in to expect good in his way, and, though I was wrong in the main, as it were, encouraged the faintest beginnings of a look toward a return. Now, though by these means I got a name to live, yet really I was dead. For the natural darkness still remained uncured. Some dawnings of light were indeed begun, and some discoveries made of what formerly I had not known. Yet the power of darkness still remained, and the veil was not yet taken away, nor were spiritual things seen in a true light. 2 Corinthians 3, 14 and 15 The enmity of my mind against the law, especially in some instances, remained in force. There was not a respect to all God's commands. I had not yet a sight of the beauty of holiness. Nor did I in my heart approve of the whole yoke of Christ's precepts as good and desirable. It was not that I delighted in holiness and conformity to the law, Psalm 119.6, at least in some instances, but that I was undone without it, that made me aim at any sort of compliance. I yet sought righteousness as it were by the works of the law, Romans 9.32. 
I was wholly legal in all I did, not seeing the necessity, the security, the glory of the gospel method of salvation by seeking righteousness and strength in the Lord Christ alone. Self was the spring of it all. My only aim was to be saved without any regard had to the glory of the Lord, or any inquiry made how it might be consistent with it to save one who had so deeply offended. In a word, all my religion was constrained, violent, selfish, legal, and anti-evangelical. These, not to mention other things, were still wrong. Reflections upon the foregoing exercise. It will not be improper to review the preceding exercise and offer two or three observations. The foregoing exercise affords me full confirmation of many of the truths contested by the Pelagians and others concerning man's inability to good and the corruption of his nature. When I read and hear their high-swelling words of vanity and commendation of man and in praise of his free will to good, his good inclinations, and when I hear specious-like arguments offered for proof of these notions, I have no reason to be shaken. Will they dispute me out of my senses? May I not believe the word? Or must I rest and distort scripture to make places that appear unfavorable to free will according with those notions of it which some advance? Sure I am if they will not allow scripture to be its own interpreter. It is safer at least in those things that concern our own natural state, which conscience may know, to admit experience to comment, rather than reason proceeding upon abstract notions. And where scripture and experience join, there we have the fullest confirmation of the truths that are established in the mouth of two such witnesses, the last not only confirming, but illustrating the testimony of the former. If they say that their hearts are not so perverse and ill-inclined, and that they find inclinations to good in them, I cannot say so of mine. Yet, by the way, I must observe that in their practice they go seldom further, if so far as others, who agree with me in owning their hearts so wicked, their corruption so strong, their wills so depraved and set upon evil, that they can do nothing well pleasing to God. Now, surely, if manners are as they represent them, they are far to blame. As for me, I find more solid truth in that one scripture that tells us that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Jeremiah 17.9, then in many volumes of idle anti-scriptural notions reared up on the subtle arguments of men whose eyes have never yet been opened to see the plague of their own hearts, and who therefore run out in asserting such an ability and power and inclination to good in man as neither scripture nor the experience of such as have their eyes in the least measure open admits of. However, if others will think that there are such good inclinations in them, I must quit my part in them. Woeful experience convinces me and obliges me to acknowledge to my own shame that I never looked towards the Lord's way, save when he drew me. I was as a bullock, unaccustomed to the yoke. Jeremiah 31.18 I never went longer in it than the force lasted. I inclined to sit down and sat indeed down at every step. No great sign I had in any heart in the way. I never got up again but when the Lord's power was of new put forth. In all this while I never went one step but with a grudge. I have frequently looked back to Sodom. I have been as a backsliding heifer. I was grieved for what I left behind. My heart cleaved to what my light had the greatest opposition to. So I was of them that rebel against the light. I often refused where the command was plainest. When I was brought into a strait, I betook myself rather to any shift than to Christ. Sin bit me, and yet I loved it. My heart deceived me often, and yet I trusted in it rather than God. God dealt with me in a way of kindness, but when he spake to me in my prosperity, I would not hear. He smote me, and I went on frowardly. I never parted with any sin till God beat and drove me from it, and hedged in my way. Hosea 2.6 Surely this looks like the heart deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. This foregoing exercise clears up what a depth of deceitfulness is in the heart of man. How many shifts has my heart used to elude the design of all these strivings of the Lord's Spirit with me? What strange shifts has the heart of man, and how many are they? I have told many, but the one half is not told. All these shifts respect but one point in religion. 
if one would undertake to give an account of those deceits which are more noted with respect to the whole of his walk and way, how many volumes might he write? How far may we go in religion and yet come short? Many things I seem to have and do. I did many things and heard gladly. I was almost persuaded to be a Christian. I seem to escape the pollutions that are in the world by the knowledge of the truth. I seemed enlightened and partaker of the heavenly gift and got some taste of the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. I cannot but look back with wonder to the astonishing patience of God that allowed my manner so long and the steadiness he shows in pursuing his work notwithstanding many provocations to desist, still working for his name's sake. Part 3, containing an account of the progress of the Lord's work for the space of about three years, ensuing from August 1696 to June 1699. When I had studied philosophy three years, being tickled with it, and somewhat puffed up with what progress I had made, and designed and expected to make, though I must own that still as knowledge increased, self-conceit decreased, and I apprehended I knew more the first year than ever I thought I knew afterwards. Thus, being prepared, I was designed to go abroad and improve myself further, to which I also was advised. But two things broke this project. My mother would not consent, and the former exercise, having brought me into bondage through fear of death, I was afraid to run the hazards I must run of my life so long as I was in so unsettled a case as to the state of my soul." Therefore, upon the notion of some friends, I consented rather to engage as chaplain to a family for some time. Accordingly, in August 1696, I went to the Wemyss. When I came here, a stranger amongst strangers and persons of considerable quality, by my natural bashfulness, the censoriousness of my auditors, the publicity of the appearances I was obliged to make, to which formerly I had not been accustomed, my lack of breeding and the like, I was for a time in a very great strait, forced to retiredness and to petition for help how to carry. And though it was my own, not the Lord's honor I designed and was concerned for, yet he that hears the cry of the ravens and would not overlook Ahab's humiliation and an Ninevite's repentance, did not fail me in my straits, but helped so far as was necessary to maintain the respect due to the station I was in, and to obtain kindness. During the first half year or so that I was here, I was somewhat diverted from my main work, being obliged to study what was necessary for my accomplishment for converse in the world. But still I held on, and the more difficulty I met with, I kept the closer to the form of religion I had taken up. Besides, now my station called and obliged me to somewhat more. But leaving this, which is only introductory, I proceed to that which is mainly and only designed in this narrative. I had not been long here, when I was often necessarily and frequently without sufficient necessity engaged in debates about the truth of religion, the divinity of the scriptures, and the most important doctrines delivered in them, in which I was drawn to read the writings of deists and other enemies to religion, that I might be acquainted with the arguments in which those whom I sometimes had occasion to dispute with opposed the truth. As to the issue of these arguings with respect to others, I shall here waive it, because others are concerned in it. Only I may say I found it true that foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law are unprofitable and vain, for evil men and seducers wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And to my sad experience, I found that their word doth eat as doth a canker or a gangrene. It is of an infectious and contagious nature, and therefore it is safest to shun and avoid them, and follow the wise man's advice to forsake the foolish and live, Proverbs 9, 6. And apart from a foolish man, when he, we perceive not in him the lips of knowledge. This is of a very dangerous consequence to me, and could not prove otherwise to one in my case. The adversary, finding all things thus prepared, set on me furiously and employed many things against me. He wrought up the natural atheism, darkness, and enmity of my heart to vent itself against the truths of religion and foolish inquiries. Is it so? How can these things be? And what authority have you, since you require such things? 
By all these means he assaulted me, and I was grievously tossed about. All the truths of religion, being of God, was again brought in question. The enemy said daily, Where is your God? And the atheism of my heart said also, There is no God, and who is the Lord? I was assaulted about his providence, and all the disorders of the world were urged to my great disturbance. As for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. The ungodly prosper in the world. They increase in riches, and therefore his people return here. Waters of a full cup are wrung out of them, and they say, How does God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? I was assaulted as to the truth of the word, in many ways troubled about it. When I read, when I thought about it, I was plied hard with grievous suggestions. I had quite sung under the weight of this trouble, and been swallowed up of sorrow, and landed in despair, if its force had not been somewhat abated by occasional considerations that were by the good hand of God. Sometimes one way, sometimes another brought to my mind. When the hellish conclusions at which all these temptations aimed, the renouncing of religion, rejecting the scriptures, and so on, were urged, it was often seasonably suggested, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, John 6:68. 6, the Lord powerfully convinced and kept the conviction strong in my mind that at what time I parted with revelation, I behoved to give up with all prospect of certainty or satisfaction about eternal life. What Deus told me of the demonstrations of a future happiness built only upon nature's light had no weight with me, because I had tried those long ago and found them to my apprehension inconclusive, and had they been conclusive, I was never a whit the nearer satisfaction. To tell me of such a state without any account of its nature or the terms in which it is attainable was all one as if nothing had been said about it. This created still a dread of the conclusion in my mind, and still when I was solicited to quit the scriptures, I returned to whom shall I go to find the words of eternal life. Upon a due observation of those who were truly religious, I could not but look on them, though their real worth I did not yet discern, as a better part of mankind, and the Lord created a dread in my soul of conclusions that imported the charge of a lie in a manner of the greatest importance against a better part of mankind. The Lord opened my eye to see the remarkable folly of those who abandoned revealed religion. Not to mention the impious lives of the generality, I saw the more sober sort guilty of unaccountable folly. The scriptures tells him plainly that if they have a mind to be satisfied as to the truth of his pretensions, they must walk in the way of his precepts to find it. If any man will do his will, he shall know this doctrine, and if it is of God, or if I speak of myself, John 7:17. 7, but they walk in a direct contradiction to his precepts, and yet complain of the want of evidence, while they refuse to try that way wherein only it is to be found. Again, some sober and learned and other inquisitive persons own that if we are either cut off from hopes or left in uncertainty about a future state of happiness, we are miserable, and that they themselves are as yet uncertain. Well, after all this has been by them confessed and by some to myself, I saw them either at little or no pains to be satisfied. The scorner seeks wisdom and doesn't find it. All this while, I was under a number of inconveniences that increased my trouble and gave advantage to my corruptions. Most of the converse I had was with such as helped forward my trouble. I was a companion of fools, and so near to destruction. For he that walks with the wise shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Again, I had no friend to whom I could, with freedom and any prospect of satisfaction, impart my mind. Woe to him that is alone when he falls, for he is not another to help him up. I was laid aside from my studies, and had no diversion, nor could follow any. I had heart to nothing, could not read, unless that sometimes I read the scriptures, or some other practical book. Unless when there was an intermission of my trouble, for near a year and a half I read very little, and this slothful posture laid me open to temptations, and made corruptions grow stronger. I went by the field of the slothful, and by the vineyard of the man void of understanding, and lo, it was all grown over with thorns and nettles that covered the face of it, and the stone wall thereof was broken down. Hereon my corruption took vent several ways, one in vain and slothful desires. 
I desired and had not. In foolish contrivances and searches how to ease my smart, I communed with my own heart upon my bed, and my spirit made diligent search. But without a do I to the Lord. Number three, I spent my time in foolish complaints that dispirited me. I complained, and my spirit was overwhelmed. I was sometimes at cursing the day of my birth, wishing that I had never been born, or that I had died as soon as born. Hereon the Lord, minding his own work, brought in the ministry of the word, the law and its spiritual meaning nearer, and then sin revived, and I died, Romans 7, 9. I found more discernibly the stirrings of corruptions. Number two, sin took an occasion from the commandment, and being fretted by the light led into my soul from the word, it wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. Under this distress I still as formerly sought to other physicians rather than to the Lord. For having now, by the knowledge of the truth, escaped the pollutions of the world, Second Peter 2.20, my exercise was much about the more secret actings of sin, and its working in the heart. And as to these, I sometimes use extenuations and excuses taken from the strength of the temptations I lay under, and other considerations of that sort. And sometimes this is done not without secret reflections on God. This is Adam's way. The woman whom you gave me to be with me, she gave me, and I did eat. Sometimes after my engagements and vows and breaches of them, when I found conscience disturb me, I began to inquire whether the things were sin, and endeavored to persuade myself that some which were most disturbing were none. But all these proved physicians of no value, for I found that they were not able to keep me longer than till a temptation came in from sin. Whenever this appeared, corruption that had been so far from being really weakened by all these inventions that it really grew in strength, broke down all that I had said in its way. Though hitherto I failed of a right issue, yet I was carried at great length in compliance with convictions. I kept myself from open pollutions. I was careful in duties of worship, yea, further, I was much in secret. I received the word with joy. I was often challenged for secret pride and belief and other heart spiritual evils, and as to the knowledge of them was considerably enlightened. I fasted, prayed, mourned in secret. I resolved and strove against sin, even my peculiar sins that I love best. Thus I had with others a name to live, and took up a form of religion. Yet for all this I was a stranger to its power, which the following evidences sufficiently manifest. For whatever length I went, yet I was a stranger to the glorious and blessed relief through the imputation of the righteousness of Christ. Not that I had not some notions of this, for I professed to embrace it. But really I was in the dark as to its glorious efficacy, tendency, and design. I was ignorant of the righteousness of God all the while. Still in all this, the eye was not single. It was only the saving of myself without any eye to the Lord's glory I designed. By these means I was brought to an extremity. My sins were set in order before me. Innumerable evils compassed me about. Mine iniquities have taken hold upon me so that I am not able to look up. They are more than the hairs upon my head, therefore my heart fails me. They were set in order in the dreadfulness of their nature and aggravations, and all shifts, extenuations, pleas, and defenses were rejected, and my mouth stopped before God. By the extremity of this anguish, I was for some time about the close of 1697 and beginning of 1698 dreadfully cast down. I was weary of my life. Often did I use Job's words, I loathe it, I would not live alway. And yet I was afraid to die. I had no rest, my sore ran in the night, and it ceased not in the day. At night I wished for day, and in the day I wished for night. Deuteronomy 28, 66, and 67. I said, My couch shall comfort me, but then darkness was as a shadow of death. When I was in this case, I was brought to the brink of despair. He filled me with bitterness. He made me drunk with wormwood. He broke all my teeth with gravel stones. He covered me with ashes. Lamentation 3.15 He removed my soul far from peace. I forgot prosperity. And I said, My strength and my hope has perished from the Lord. Remembering mine affliction and my misery, the wormwood and the gall. My soul had then still in remembrances and was bowed in me. 
Now I was made to think it a wonder that I was not consumed, and though I dreaded destruction from the Almighty, yet I could not but justify him if he had destroyed me. Righteous is the Lord, for I have rebelled. Lamentations 118. I was made to fear that the Lord would make me a Magar Misabib, a terror to myself. Jeremiah 24. And all round about, and that he would make some dreadful discovery of my wickedness, that would make me a reproach to religion and give the enemies advantage, which put me upon the psalmist's prayer. Deliver me from all my transgressions. Make me not the reproach of the foolish. I was made to wonder that I was not already cut off, and indeed this is sometimes reviving. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fell not. This I recall to mind, therefore have I hope. But this hope was easily clouded, it amounted to no more than this, who can tell but he may be gracious. And to this my fearful heart suggested the greatness of my sins is above the reach of pardoning mercy, and Satan daily urged me to give over and take some desperate course to say there is no hope. So I walked about dejected, weary and heavy laden, weary of my disease and weary of the vain courses I had taken for relief, and uncertain what to do, what course to take. I took counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily. Psalm 13, verse 2. This ends part three of the memoirs of Thomas Halliburton, chapter one.